Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. We're going to start there tonight. We won't be there for long, but we are going to start there in John chapter 3. Whose Bible is this? Man. Who's this? Man, you've got to be a man to carry a Bible like that. Whew. Hey, what? I can't even carry that thing around. Mine's not that big, not that heavy. So John chapter 3. I was really excited about the service last night. Uh, we preached from John chapter 3 on how a person can know for sure uh, that they'll be able to go to heaven whenever they die. And a uh, tremendous service. Uh, we just preached the truth of God's Word. And uh, there were eight, nine kids, uh, eight, nine teenagers, they're not kids anymore, that uh, trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior last night. And I just want to pick up right there and just kind of explain something to you. And we're going to use the most famous verse in all the Bible to do that. And that's John chapter 3 and verse what? 16. 16. Okay, so find your Bibles and find John chapter 3 and verse 16. Even if you know this verse by heart, I want you to go ahead and turn there. And I want you to look at it because I want you to see it in the Bible, uh, the words that are used. And that's always a help whenever we look at the Word of God and then we believe what the Word of God says. Okay, John chapter 3 and verse 16. Okay? Would you say it with me? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever goes to church and does good things and gets money and all of this stuff will have ever... You know, did, I, did I make a mistake? That's not what at all what the Bible says, is it? You know, that's what a lot of people think, for those of you who weren't here last night, is a lot of people think that uh, the way you get to heaven is by being good. And that's not what the Bible teaches. A lot of people think that whenever you get to heaven, God's going to have this big scale there. And uh, somehow or another, all the good things that you've done are kind of, kind of materialized into this weight, and that's going to go on one side of the scale. All the bad things you've done are going to materialize and go on to the other side of the scale. And as long as your good outweighs the bad, then you'll be able to go to heaven. You know that is nowhere in the Bible. Yet that's what so very many people think. So many people think that if I'm just good, if I just go to church, if I'm just faithful, if I, if I just do good things, if I read my Bible, if I pray and, and, and take care of guest speakers when they come and do all those things, they all have a lot of good works when they get to heaven and then I'll be able to get in. That's not what the Bible says. Okay, so let's read John 3.16. I'm going to read it right this time. What does the Bible say? How does a person know for sure that they can get to heaven? All right, let's try that again. I'll try to behave this time. John 3.16, okay? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. All right, this is very simple what the Bible is saying. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was sent to this earth. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect, sinless life. About the time He was 33, He was crucified on the cross of Calvary. Okay? And the Bible says when Jesus was hanging on that cross that God the Father reached down and He took your sins off of you. He took your sins off of you, Gavin. Right? He took your sins off of everybody in this room. He took your sins off of you, Miss Emily. And He put them onto His Son, Jesus Christ. And He punished Jesus Christ for the things that you've done wrong, Gavin, and the things that you've done wrong, Emily, and the things that I've done wrong. I don't know. You're just sitting there on the edge, right? But I just want you to understand that's exactly what happened. When Jesus was dying on the cross, God took your sins off of you. He put them onto Jesus Christ. And He punished Jesus. He was your substitute. The Bible says if you will believe that, that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins, then you can have an eternal home in heaven. Okay, that's what the Bible teaches. Now, the Bible uses a very interesting word here in John chapter 3 and verse 16. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. All right? Now, we heard this message on hell a little while ago out of Luke chapter 16. All right? Now, when the Bible says here in John chapter 3, 16, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, that's exactly what it's talking about. The word perish there means going to the real place called hell. All right? It says, if you believe in Jesus, that He died on the cross for your sins, you will not perish, you will not go to hell when you die, but you will have everlasting life. Now life, I think everybody understands that, right? But what does this word everlasting mean? Could somebody give me a definition maybe for that? Go ahead. Uh, like never ending. Never ending. Somebody else want to give it a shot? Immortality. Immortality. You want to give it a shot? Forever. Forever. Forever? Somebody else over here? Eternity. All right. You know what was fascinating about all of them? Go ahead. Infinite. Infinite. Oh, that's, I mean, that's pretty good. Okay. you got all these good definitions. Okay. Now, the Bible says when you believe in Jesus Christ that you have everlasting life. So let me ask you a question. 
Uh, let's say that today, uh, I think today is Tuesday. Let's say you got saved today. Today is Tuesday, right? And all the, the days of the week, they just kind of blur together for me, okay? All right, so let's say uh, today is Tuesday, and you got saved today. Now, the Bible says you have everlasting life. Now, let's suppose that it's tomorrow, okay? What kind of life would you have tomorrow if you received everlasting life on Tuesday? Somebody shout it out. This is not a trick question. Everlasting life? If you have everlasting life on Tuesday, what kind of life do you have on Wednesday? Everlasting life. That's good, man. You're smarter than you look. Okay, that's great. All right, good. All right, now listen. Hey, hey, hey. If you have everlasting life on Tuesday, what kind of life would you have all the way, let's say, on Saturday? Everlasting. Everlasting life. That's amazing. Okay, let's make it a little bit harder. If you have everlasting life on Tuesday, what kind of life would you have next year, 365 days down the road next year, what kind of life would you have on Tuesday, this same day next year? Everlasting! Now, why would you have never, ever, everlasting life? Because everlasting life never ends. Isn't that right? Isn't that amazing? You know what that means? If you get saved, you're saved. Isn't that cool? If you get saved, you don't ever have to be saved again. In fact, you don't want to ever be saved again because you've already been saved. You get saved one time. If you have trusted Jesus Christ, like we preached last night, if that serpent's been lifted up, if Jesus Christ has been lifted up, you look to Him to forgive you of your sins. It's done. You have everlasting life. All right, here, let me ask you this. If you got saved yesterday, on Tuesday, no, on Monday, see, I told you, it's really difficult for me. If you got saved yesterday, all right, what kind of life would you have, oh, I don't know, 35 years from now? Everlasting. 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 It never ends. It never ends. Oh, no, 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 no. What happens if, um, let's say you got saved yesterday, and then let's say sometime next year you do something really bad. I mean, just some atrocious sin. And then I ask you that same question, what kind of life do you have? What kind of life do you have? Everlasting. Everlasting life. You see, you see how this works? Everlasting life, it really means forever. All right, now that's a wonderful truth, kids. Don't ever forget that, okay? Now the devil hates the fact that you got saved yesterday. The devil, the devil hates the fact that you got saved whenever you got saved. For those of you who have been saved some other time, the devil hates the fact that you're saved. He hates that I'm saved. And you know what the devil is in the business of? He's in the business of doubt. And you know what his goal in life is now that you're saved? He wants to make you feel or think that you are not saved. Now, anytime that happens, young person, this is what you can do. You can go to the Bible and you can open up to the most famous verse in all the Bible of John chapter 3 and verse 16. And just read the verse and look at the Word of God. It's faith in the Word of God and what God has said. If you read that verse and it says that if you believed in Him that you have everlasting life, guess what kind of life did you have? Everlasting, everlasting life. This is what you do. You just tell it to the devil. Say, according to John 3 16, I have everlasting life. I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ to forgive me my sins. Therefore, it's a done deal. Now, there are other verses. It doesn't just say this once. I love this. If you can find John 3.16, you can find another fascinating verse that can be a tremendous help to you. The very last verse in that chapter. If you'll just remember John 3.16, you can read John 3.16. And then if you just go to the end of that chapter, it's verse 36. All right, you can read that verse. It'll be a tremendous help to you too. Let's read it right now. It says this. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Isn't that, isn't that simple? Yeah. Is that confusing? No. Is anybody confused by that? No. no. It's very straightforward. Don't let the devil confuse you about it either, okay? What the Bible says is true. If you believed in him, then you have everlasting life. Now, the verse goes on. It says, He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Now, that statement is equally true. If you're here tonight and you've never been saved, you do not have everlasting life. And the Bible actually says that the wrath of God abideth upon you. Back in John chapter 3 and verse 18, it talks about the fact that you are living under the condemnation of God because you're, you, you've never had your sins forgiven. Now, if you're here tonight and you've never had your sins forgiven, you've never trusted in Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins, you can do that tonight. And I hope that you will. It'll be the most important decision that you ever made. If you made that decision tonight, you'd have everlasting life. If you made that decision tonight, you wouldn't go to hell whenever you died. You'd go to heaven whenever you died. Okay? Isn't that simple? All right, let's believe that, okay, what the Bible says. Now, that isn't really what I wanted to talk to you about tonight, but I wanted to mention it because so many of you did trust Christ as your Savior yesterday. And what I want to talk to you about is baptism. Now, Taj, whenever he was talking 
I think he was using uh, Fuji. Where's Fuji? He's right here. He was asking him all these questions. He was saying, what? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? Right? Then he finally got to where he died and said, okay, well, what's next? And then it was heaven and hell. Right? Now, the question for you. If you get saved, what's next? Heaven. Heaven. Baptist. Not heaven. You've got a whole life to live. Okay? <laughs> all right? That's great. You've got everlasting life. You're going there. That's a wonderful thing. But it's not yet. Okay? You're not going to heaven yet. Okay? You've got a life to live. A life to serve the Lord Jesus Christ today. You. But the very first thing on that list, the very first thing that you need to do if you trust that Jesus Christ as your Savior, is you need to be baptized. Now, I don't want you to take my word for that. Uh, Brother Price, or Pastor Price, excuse me, whenever he was standing up there, he said people have a lot of very confused ideas about salvation. Some people think, or excuse me, about baptism. Some people think that babies should be baptized. You know, but you know, we don't find that in the Bible. I was telling somebody before uh, the church service tonight that we believe the Bible. And the Bible is our standard for faith and practice. So therefore, if it's not in this book, I don't believe it. Okay? If it's in this book, then I believe it. Okay, so I want to share with you tonight what this book says about baptism. Okay? And the first thing I want you to see is that baptism should immediately follow salvation. Okay, now maybe you've been here, you're here tonight, and uh, you've been saved, and it's been a while, but you've never been baptized. Well, this message is for you. Okay? You need to be baptized. It's the first act of obedience after you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Now, take your Bible turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, we've been kind of talking about this. You know, if you wanted to look and find the story about Jesus in the Bible, which four books would you look at? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, if you want to find the history of the church, which book do you look at? Acts. The book of Acts. Guess why we're going to the book of Acts? Because it's the history of the church, okay? All right? So we're going to the book of Acts, and we're going to start in chapter 2, and we're just going to see what it says. We're going to look at quite a few verses tonight. But I want to try to prove to you from the Bible that salvation, uh, baptism is the first thing that needs to follow salvation. Now in Acts chapter 2, I'm going to start reading in verse number 1. It says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noise abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded, because that every man heard them speak in his own language. Now this is a fascinating story, and people get so confused about what I just read to you. Okay? Now here is basically the beginning of the church, if I could say it that way. Okay? This is when the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven okay, and initially fills uh, the believers. All right? Peter is there, and a whole bunch of other believers, and Jesus Christ are there. All right? And now they have been specifically gifted by God. They've been filled with the Holy Spirit, and they begin speaking in tongues. How many of you have ever heard about speaking in tongues? Raise your hand. All right? Now this is what we a lot of times think about speaking in tongues. Somebody's speaking in some, some unknown language. It like, sounds like gobbledygook and all these things. Okay? But that is not the teaching of the Bible. Okay? The Bible says very specifically, and we read it there at the end of verse number 6. Look at the end of verse number 6. It says, because that every man heard them speak in what? His own language. Okay? So these men were speaking in known languages. It just wasn't their language. It would be like if there were some German people here, and some French people here, and some Spanish people here, and all of a sudden God started allowing me to speak all of their languages, and then they heard in their own language. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? Well, that's what this is. This is a miracle. So, the reason that this is happening is because all these different people were there, all these different nationalities were there, and uh, this P one person, Peter, and those that he were with, they, they couldn't communicate to them all. So, so, God gave a special gift at this point in time and allowed this to take place where they were able to speak with languages that weren't there, they heard with languages that weren't there, and then all these people were able to hear the gospel so that they could also have everlasting life, okay? So, there's all these people here. And then there's some confusion about what's going on. And in verse 15, look at it. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 15, it says, some people are saying, for these, uh, or excuse me, right before that, they're accused of being drunk. In verse 13, it says, others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Okay? And in verse 15, Peter stands up and says, these are not drunken as you suppose, seeing but it is the third hour of the day. And then he goes on to explain what it is. And then Peter here begins to preach to them. And Peter preaches unto them a message of salvation. Okay? And now let's look over in uh, verse number uh, 37. It says, Now when they heard this, the people that were sitting under the preaching, they were pricked in their heart. They were convicted about what they had heard. They, can, they were convicted about the fact that they were a sinner and that they deserved to go to hell. And they, were, they, they knew that they needed to trust Jesus to be their Savior. So they were pricked in their heart, said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Look down at verse 41. 
says, Then they, those that heard the word, they that gladly received the word, okay, they believed in Jesus Christ, they were being saved, they trusted the Lord as their Savior, as we just talked about from John chapter 3 and verse 16, then they that gladly received the word were what? Baptized. Isn't that amazing? Just right there, right off the bat. They received the word, and they were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now it says the baptized, and then it says what? And the uh, same day. Man, I'm telling you what, they were a little uh, they were a little radical here in the New Testament, weren't they, Pastor? I mean, they, they got saved and they just baptized on the same day. Just, they, just got, they just went ahead and got it over with. And uh, you know what, I believe that's, that's, the biblical t that's the biblical model. A person gets saved, they get baptized. That's the next step. That's what they need to do. So for any of you who have trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you need to get baptized according to the Bible. Now this is not the only place in the Bible that this is mentioned. So I want to show you a couple other places. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8. Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5. I'm just going to show you a lot of verses because I believe that the Bible is authoritative and I believe if I can show it to you in the Bible, then it should be settled, okay? Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So he went down to this city. You know, it's kind of like me. All right, I'm not from here, but I came down to this city and what have I been doing? I've been preaching, preaching Christ unto you, Okay? So this is what Philip's done. He's gone to Samaria and he's been preaching Christ, okay? And uh, people are getting saved there, and it's very exciting. And now look down at verse 12. It says, But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were, what? Baptized. baptized. And it says, both men and women. Hey, it doesn't matter if you're a man. It doesn't matter if you're a girl. You should be baptized, okay? Both men and women. The Bible says if you get saved, you need to be baptized. It's right there. Now look in verse number 26. So this is a whole bunch of people. He's gone down to the city of Samaria. He's preaching Christ. All these people are getting saved. And he says, all right, it's time to be baptized. And he, they baptize them all right there. Now verse 35, excuse me, verse 26, something interesting happens. Here uh, Philip is. He's preaching. And all these people are getting saved. And then the Holy Spirit talks to Philip and says, hey, I want you to leave. I need you to go out to the middle of the desert. And then we see that there in verse 26. And it says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Now we're not going to read all the passage there, but why did the Holy Spirit send him down there to the desert? Because there was an Ethiopian eunuch who was traveling through that desert who needed to be saved. He needed to have somebody preach Jesus unto him. Okay? So this Ethiopian eunuch is traveling across the desert. Philip obeys. He goes down there. He runs into the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch, would you have any idea what he was doing? He was reading the Bible. And he didn't understand what he was reading. So he said, Philip, can you explain to me what I'm reading? And Philip says, sure I can. So he jumps up into the uh, uh, um, uh, carriage with him. And look in verse 35. Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him who? Jesus. Jesus. He preached unto him Jesus. Isn't that simple? Okay? Now let's just keep reading there in verse 36. As they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. That's fascinating. It's a desert, but there ended up being some water out there. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder or prevent me from being baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. This is fascinating. All right, the eunuch here answers a very, uh, asks a very good question. Why should I not be baptized? Okay? And the answer is you can be baptized if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Right? That's what being saved is. All right? So what does this tell us here from the Scriptures? If you've never been saved, you don't need to be baptized. Okay? Baptism follows salvation. Can you say that with me? Baptism, Baptism follows salvation. salvation. Now, there are people out there that teach that babies should be baptized. Can somebody tell me how or why I would have a problem with that from what I just read here in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. It's not in the Bible, but why is it not in the Bible? What can a baby not do? They cannot believe. A baby can't believe. A baby can't believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior. They can't understand the message that we preached last night. They, they have no idea. They, they, they don't even know how to feed themselves. So they, they shouldn't be baptized. Baptism follows salvation. Okay? Perhaps you were baptized when you were a baby. And what the Bible is saying here is that you really shouldn't have been. But if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, the first step after your salvation should be that you be baptized. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Now, this is not my ideas. Okay? 
I'm just reading to you the Scriptures. I'm showing it to you in the Bible, and that's why I'm doing it this way, because I want you to see what the Bible says. And if the Bible says it to me, it's settled. Right? The Bible says if you believe in Jesus, you need to be baptized. Now, look in Acts chapter 9, and we'll read verses 1 through 6. And Saul, yet breathing, uh, breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now Saul here was going out, and he was a, a Jew among Jews, and he was against Christianity. And he was going out to capture those who had professed faith in Jesus Christ so that he could take them and put them in prison. And the Bible says, as he was on his way to Damascus to put people in jail for being Christians, that there was this bright light in heaven, and it was Jesus Christ who appeared to him, and he had this conversation with him. He told him he needed to go into the city. And later in this chapter, we read that a man by the Ananias, the whole, God speaks to him as well, and tells Ananias to come and speak to Saul, who's later, his name was changed, and he becomes Paul. All right? Ananias here speaks to him, and we read that over in verse 17. Now, wouldn't you have been a little bit nervous if you were Ananias? Here's this man who like goes around killing Christians, and putting them in jail, and then God speaks to you and says, hey, I want you to go talk to this murdering guy who kills all the Christians. That'd be hard, wouldn't it? But Ananias obeyed the Lord, and he went, and he went, and then he went to uh, be obedient, and he went to talk to uh, Saul. Look at it in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way, as thou camest, hath sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight. Saul had been blinded by the light. And uh, be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes that had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was? Wow, isn't that now, later in the book of Acts, we're not going to take the time to turn there, Paul is giving his testimony. Okay? And it's fascinating, Paul did not get saved when Jesus appeared to him in the light from heaven. A lot of people think that, but that's not what happened. Paul had to go to the city so that Ananias could come to him. When Ananias came to him, you know what he told him? He told him the gospel told him the good news of Jesus Christ. Then Paul believed that. And then, since he believed it, what did Ananias say to him? Well, since you believed, you need to be baptized. Oh, look at that. So, belief follows baptism. All right? It's just everywhere. It's everywhere you look in the Bible. In Acts chapter 10, I preached this on Sunday morning about Cornelius and his friends. And we won't recount the whole story. But Cornelius and his friends, they hear the gospel. Peter comes to see them. He preaches the gospel to them. They believe on Jesus Christ. And look in uh, Acts chapter 10, verses 47 and 48. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? You know, whenever you get saved, an amazing thing has happens. The Holy Ghost, the third person in the Godhead, comes and lives inside of you. They receive the Holy Ghost. So what the Bible is saying here is since they've received the Holy Ghost, that means that they were saved, that they need to be baptized. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? And of course, the answer was no. And so they baptized them. They baptize everybody. Everybody that believes. Look in Acts chapter 18. You know, we're skipping people. I mean, I could stop in almost any chapter in Acts. I could talk to you about the Philippian jailer. I could talk to you about a lady by the name of Lydia. Everybody who, who believes, they just get baptized the same day. I mean, it's just amazing. It's just all over the place. And I believe that this is what the Bible wants us to do. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 8, it says, In Christmas, the chief ruler of the synagogue, he was a Jew, believed on the Lord with all his house. Everybody in his whole family believed. It's so exciting. I love it when that happens. Okay, and it says, And many of the Corinthians hearing believed. So what were they doing? They were believing what? They were believing the gospel, weren't they? All right, so we're in Acts chapter 18 and verse 8 at the end. It says, The Corinthians hearing believed and were? Oh, look at there. There it is again. Are you beginning to see a pattern here in the Bible in the New Testament? All right, baptism follows what? Salvation. Okay. So if you got saved, you need to be baptized. If you're saved, maybe you got saved a couple of years ago and you've never trusted the Lord for baptism, you need, to, you need to obey Christ and you need to be baptized. My wife got saved as a young lady. I'm not sure exactly how old she was. I think she was six uh, whenever she trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. And uh, she was scared to, death, scared to death of water. And I'll tell you something else my wife was scared to death about. She probably wouldn't admit this to you, but she was scared to death about getting up in front of people. <laughs> okay? So this was a double bad thing. She didn't want to get up in front of the church. To be baptized, she was scared of water. She didn't want to be baptized. And so she just said, no, I'm not going to be baptized. She will tell you now that for years, 
She would. She just could not grow in her Christianity. She could not grow in, in, in her relationship with the Lord. Why? Because she was being disobedient to what she knew to be true. You know, maybe you came tonight and you didn't know you needed to be baptized, but you do know now because you've heard a preacher from the Word of God. So now it's a responsibility for you, okay? You know that God wants you to be baptized. Okay? Now it's your responsibility to be baptized. If you don't get baptized, now you're disobedient to the Lord and it's going to hinder your walk with God. Now God says very simply that if you're saved, you should be baptized. Now, what is baptism? Okay? It's very it's just the first step of obedience, okay? And you need to do this uh, to identify with Christ, okay? And it is a public identification that you have been saved. It is being willing to just show it to everybody. Just stand up, shout it to the top of your lungs, whatever it's going to be. You're going to identify with Christ. Okay? Now, um, let's see. I'm going to use this. All right. Now, when a person gets baptized, I'm going to pretend that this is the person. Okay? They walk down into some water and they're standing there. Okay? And then what happens? Somebody does what to them? They, they push them underwater. They don't sprinkle them. Okay? A lot of the different passages that we talked about, like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. They both went down into the water. You don't have to go all the way down into the water if you're just going to sprinkle them, right? You just reach down the edge, man. You reach up and sprinkle them. No, they have to go all the way down the water because the word baptism means to immerse, all right? It means to go under the water, all right? So here it is. You're standing in the baptismal waters. Then you go down underneath the water, and then you come back up again, all right? Everybody seen somebody baptized before? You've seen this? This is what happens, okay? Now, this is a picture, and I want to explain to you what the picture is, okay? Now, Jesus Christ died on the cross, didn't He? Yes. All right, that's a picture. When you just first get in the baptism tree, all right, that's what it is. Jesus Christ died on the cross. Now, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did they do to His body? Him. Now, what happens to you whenever you baptize? Do you go where? Underwater. <sighs> now, what does that represent? What's that a picture of? That's a picture of the burial of Jesus Christ. Isn't that fascinating? Do you know that's what baptism was? All right, now, thankfully, whenever you get baptized... Pastor Price doesn't hold you under in this position. <laughs> All right? That would be very bad, okay? But you know what? Jesus Christ, the grave couldn't hold him either, could it? What happened to Jesus Christ three days after he was put in the grave? He rose again. What happens at the end of the after you go under the water? Wow. What does that symbolize? The resurrection. When you get saved, you're showing everybody that you believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? It doesn't do anything for you other than get you wet. And I, I mean by that, it doesn't save you. Okay? It doesn't wash away your sins. Jesus Christ does that. But you are testifying to everybody who's watching, I believe that Jesus Christ died, and was buried, and was rose again. That's what baptism is. Isn't that exciting? I remember recently uh, sitting down and I was talking with a girl. And uh, she was asking me what baptism means. And I used my pen and, and I showed her this. And I'm telling you, her eyes got about as big as watermelon. She's like, wow, that is so cool. I didn't know that, you know. She was just so excited. She's like, this is great, you know. I need to be baptized. I believe that. Maybe that's you. Maybe that's you. I've been saved. I believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose again. I believe he forgave me my sins. And I'd like to be baptized. I'd like to publicly identify with Jesus Christ. And you can certainly do that. Um, I could say other things. Um, let me just... Um, I'm almost out of time. Let me just say a few things very quickly. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 21, there's an interesting process here. Um, Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word, that's being saved, were baptized. And then it says right after that, And the same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Okay? Now the word added there kind of has the idea that they were added to the group of Christians. All right? This is like church membership. Okay? Now, before you can join a church... You need to be baptized, according to the Bible. Baptism precedes church membership. So you're saved, you're baptized, and then you can join the church. That's what the Bible is saying here. All right, you're saved, you're baptized, and then you're added unto the church. Then after that, in verse 42, it says, And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Okay? Listen, baptism is kind of a serious thing. You're saying that I believe in Jesus Christ and I'm going to live my life like it. When you come up out of the water, the pastor normally says something like this, raised to walk in newness of life. You ever heard that before? What does that mean? That means when you're raised, okay, you're going to walk like a Christian. You're going to do the things that you should do. You're going to be obedient to the Bible. 
This is what you're doing. You're testifying to everybody. I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm a follower of Christ. I want to follow Christ. I want to do right. I want to be a Christian. I want everybody to know that I'm a Christian. That's what being baptized is. Okay? Everybody understand that? All right? You've got to be baptized if you want to be able to join a church. Um, what else could I say? I could say so much more. Let me say this. There are some people, and these people really make me mad. Can I just be honest with you? There are some people that say that they are not going to stand up and fight over the mode of baptism. You know, they don't really care if somebody's sprinkled. They don't really care if somebody's immersed. They don't really care about any of this stuff. I say that's pathetic. The Bible very clearly teaches immersion. Can I just tell you something about church history? People who believe like we do, let's say, oh, I don't know, 600 years ago, 1,000 years ago in the Dark Ages, you want to know what happened to them when they were baptized by immersion because they believed in Jesus Christ? You want to know what happened to them? A lot of times they died. They died because they believed the Bible. They did what the Bible said. They did it the Bible way. They were immersed. And because of that, people killed them. They're back, back in the Dark Ages, they had this saying. They said, He who is immersed will be immersed. And what does that mean? That means if you actually wanted to follow the Bible, and you wanted to be baptized like the Bible says you need to be baptized. And you were actually baptized after salvation and you said, okay, I believe in the Bible. I believe that uh, God forgave me my sins and these types of things. They would take you. They would strap you to a chair. They would chain you to that chair. They would put weights all over that chair. And then they would baptize you. They would permanently throw you out and they would drown you. Do you think that the mode of baptism was important to those people? No. Yeah, it was. Yes. They were willing to die for it. Yeah. Yeah, the people who were who were being killed. They were willing to die for it. You know what? I'm willing to die for what the Bible says. Yeah. I believe everything that book says. If the Bible says it, I believe it. It's a done deal. Ain't nobody going to talk me out of it. Why? Because I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Baptism is important. People, thousands of people, more people have died over differences over baptism than because of any other biblical difference in the world. And we are privileged here because we don't have that problem. And it's exciting. You can be baptized and nobody's going to kill you. Isn't that great? I think it's great. When I was baptized, nobody killed me. I'm pretty excited about that. But you know what? And even if there were people out there that wanted to kill you, you know what I'd still be preaching tonight? That you need to be baptized. That's what the Bible says. I just kind of went in on that note. It's a serious thing. You know, following the Bible is not a joke. It's not, it's not something that you do because, I don't know, it's child's play. You think it's funny or whatever. But if you want to be a follower of Christ, you want to do what's right. You've been saved. You've got to be baptized. Make sense? All right, let's bow our heads and close Father, I thank you for the time we've had to be able to spend together tonight. Lord, we love you. I thank you for your word. Lord, we wouldn't. We wouldn't know anything about baptism if, if we didn't have the Bible to tell us, Lord, what you think about it. And so, Father, I thank you for teaching us through your word, Lord, that baptism follows salvation, and it's really a step of obedience, and, Lord, it's something that we need to do, um, Lord, right after we're saved. Father, we just thank you, and in Jesus' name I pray. Let's do this. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Would you do that for me just for a minute as we conclude here tonight? Now, we very beginning I was talking about the gospel from John chapter 3 and verse 16 about how you can have your sins forgiven. Can I just ask is there somebody here tonight and you say you know what I've never trusted Jesus Christ to be my savior before? I've never done that. I've never been forgiven of my sins. If that's you would you raise your hand right where you sit? I'm not going to call you forward and embarrass you in any any way. Anybody like that? I've never trusted Jesus Christ to be my savior. Anybody? Alright now let me ask this question. How many of you in the room, you've been saved, but you've never been baptized? Would you raise your hand? Wonderful. Yeah, there's hands all over the place. Hands all over the room. I put your hands down. Let me ask you this. Because of what you've heard tonight from the Bible, not, not the preacher. The preacher's not important. Because of what the Bible says, you say, you know what? I believe the Lord would want me to be baptized. Would you raise your hand? Okay, wonderful. All right, now here's what I want you to do. At the end of the service, Pastor Price has some decision cards in the back. Is that right, Pastor Price? Yes. He has some decision cards. 
This is what I want you to do. I want you to go to the back. I want you to ask for a decision card. I want you to fill it out. It's very simple. It has your name and a place for the decision. I want you to put on there something I think is there's even a checkbox that you can fill out that says you'd like to be baptized. Okay? I want you to do that because you want to be obedient to the Lord and you want to follow what He says in His Word. Okay? I'm going to pray and then we're going to conclude our service. All right? Father, thank you so much for the willingness of these people to be willing to follow Lord, your word and what it says about the subject of baptism. Father, I thank you for their salvation. I thank you that they have eternal life. Father, help them now as new Christians, Lord, to be obedient, Lord, to the directions that you give in the scripture. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Pastor Price, would you like to come to the, to the front and conclude or anything in any way? Yeah? Why don't you come? Thank you for your attention tonight. I really appreciate you listening. I've enjoyed preaching to you. Okay, guys, I think it's always wrong to preach that you ought to do something and then not let you do it. And so what we want to do is we want to go ahead and let you make the decision. If you made a decision that you want to be baptized, we want to go ahead and make and arrange for it to happen. And so, Brother Lee, you want to come get these real quick? Let Brother Lee stand in the back. And uh, if you made the decision to get baptized, I'll have Brother Taj, Brother Charlie, and Brother Duke back there. If you made a decision you want to be baptized, uh, we're going to have a baptismal service tomorrow night. Now, you need to talk to your parents. You say, hey, Mom and Dad, would you please come to church? Because I want to get baptized, and I want you to see me there. One of the things, Brother Duke, uh, one of the things that he didn't have time